So thank you very much for welcoming us uh, here today. And we appreciate being given this opportunity to talk to you and to talk to this group about academic integrity. So as Maura implied, this is, this is somewhat of a first, but it's not the first time we're talking about academic integrity, so fear not. Um, I'll give you a little bit of, of context on who we are, where we're situated, what our objectives are, um, and you'll see through the workshop, uh, all of those ideas come through as well. So this workshop is part of a new pilot program that we are running in the provost's office. So the pilot program is the existence of an academic integrity hub. It's a new central unit that's situated in the provost's office who has as its mission to support instructors, to support students, and to support faculties with a capital F um, as part of the misconduct process and around academic integrity. So we're really taking a holistic We see these as part of the, the full cycle and we want to um, support all aspects of it. So thank you again to Maura for inviting us. And the pilot dimension really comes into play. We will be eager for your feedback. So whether from Zach or from the rest of the group around how this resonated for, for faculty, is it something that we'd like to start to offer in other faculties as well? So as Maura said, my name is Ainsley Rouse. I'm an academic integrity senior manager in the provost's office, and I lead the activity and the strategic direction of the academic integrity hub. My background is in French literature and book history. So I come from academia, um, but not in any way connected to, to the discipline that we're talking about today, but have worked with students and administrators and faculties for many, many years prior to joining UBC two and a half years ago. And I'll let my colleague Jared introduce himself before we get started. So, hello everyone. I hope uh, everyone can hear me. Yes, I'm Jared, Jared Taylor. I am the Academic Integrity Program Manager, uh, I, like Ainsley, out of the, um, the Provost's office. And uh, I work with Ainsley to help promote academic integrity. I'm also the one that the students come to see if they are referred to us for cases of academic misconduct. So I do have a very student-facing role. And I've been involved with students for a long time here at UBC. I've been an instructor in the biology program for oof, at least a decade. So I have a, and I did my postdoc at UBC in science of teaching and learning. So I've, I've been at UBC for quite a while. And uh, yeah, so that's me and I'll pass it back to Ainsley. Great. Um, so we can get started, Jared, then with the next slide, please. So what I'd like to begin with is just a couple more words about the Academic Integrity Hub, just so you can really understand the direction of this workshop and where the resources that we're going to talk about and the strategies and the ideas come from. So the Academic Integrity Hub is a new unit in the Provost's Office. It was born from consultation across campus in 2020, 2021. And Maura, of course, was part of one of those working groups that started to discuss ways that the institution could better support various stakeholder groups for academic integrity. This is a topic that impacts everyone at the institution. It is not just a student issue. It's not just a faculty issue. And we really wanted to put together a support structure that would allow us to support all of those who are involved. Um, the objective of our unit then is support, and we support what we call an educative approach to academic integrity, which I'll get into a little bit more uh, further along. But very briefly, the three pillars of our activity are awareness, education, and support. So awareness means we look for ways that UBC can reinforce its commitment to academic integrity, to think about ways that academic integrity might interact with other strategic commitments that the university has. So that's really on the institutional level. Education is our second pillar, and that's supporting instructors as well as supporting students to both teach and learn about academic integrity. So that could be through central resources that we create and put on our academicintegrity.ubc.ca page, or it could be more direct outreach like this, or like Take Five campaign, which we'll talk about later on, where presenters can come into, your, into various classrooms to talk directly to students. And the last one is support. The provost office now is involved in direct case management and support for academic misconduct. So as you can see, we really try to cover the entirety of the academic integrity cycle. And I believe that's on to me now. So uh, what we wouldn't to accomplish with this workshop, and again, this is the first time we're trying it, so thank you for being willing to have us and come and do this, is we just have a few objectives. We know that everybody here is your experts in academic integrity. We're not here to tell you what that is, rather just to share some ways that we've found in our experience to actually 
promote it and share it with students, right? Especially just make sure that everybody's on the same page student-wise and academic integrity-wise when they're taking classes. So what we hope to do today is obviously we want to introduce academic integrity at UBC. We want to discuss why it's important. Again, probably not surprising for anybody. We want to discuss it, discuss ways to promote academic integrity in the courses, in the classroom, talk about the types of academic misconduct that um, we define here at UBC and have some group discussions. It's a workshop. We do have to have, we hope to have some back and forth in between each of you. Uh, during this workshop. And just to also point out what this is not meant to be, this isn't meant to be a, a dive into the nursing program's internal workings of how they deal with academic misconduct. There are many programs, many faculties at UBC, everybody hands us slightly differently. So we actually are not experts at that. And we weren't going to cover that. We also aren't uh, here to talk about different technologies that are used for promoting, or I shouldn't say promoting, for detecting and enforcing academic integrity, things like Turnitin. We're actually not experts. That's more the ballywick of the Center for Teaching and Learning Technology. But we're here to discuss specifically how to promote and talk about academic integrity in your classes. So to start, we thought we would um, throw it back to you just to start with a bit of a, hopefully, some group discussion. What does academic integrity mean to you? And here, when we say that, we are thinking in the context of we, if we know what it is, what does it mean to you and how would you explain that to others? So what we'd like to do, and we'll try this, is to hear from you. Now, we're going to try a whiteboard here. You can try typing on the screen or you can type in chat or you can turn on your microphones and actually tell us. But what we're curious about is just to start, what does it mean to you? What does academic integrity mean to you? And if you had more specifically, if you had to explain it to somebody else, you have to give the 30 second elevator pitch to someone else, how would you explain it? And we're curious because, of course, oh, and I apologize for the dogs barking in the background. Why is academic integrity important to the nursing graduate programs, right? In the School of Nursing and the different programs, why is it important? Explain that to others. How would you explain that? So let's throw that out to the group. And we're going to try the whiteboard. So what we what you can do is, I believe, uh, let's just see. Maura, do you have? Yes, annotation is turned on. So if you go to view options, you should be able to type on the screen. Just So let's try this. And if you'd like to put it in or turn on your microphone. So let's just throw it out to the group and see if anybody gives us anything. Anyone want to start? Well, let's start. What does academic mean to you if you had to explain it to somebody? So this is. Oh, yes, you can type on the screen. So oh. following academic standards, there's one. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can. Oh. Yep, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, to me, it, it's respect. Respect for yourself and your colleagues who are reading your work. Um, that's the first thing that comes to mind. I didn't Google it to get the answer. <laughs> so that's just what pops into my head. Is there's a respect for, for our profession in terms of the nursing. Um, and that, um, uh, yeah. No, that's great. And thank you. And by the way, we run this little exercise with the students that come to see us as well. And so we, we find it very illuminating about the different things that they will tell us both before and after we work with them. So some other things that are coming up on the screen, honesty, morality, respect for the profession, respect for yourself and your colleagues, and uh, transparency. And I'm not sure what the, well, maybe the Second part of that is, in fact, transparent. I can't read it, but transparency and something. Um, any others out there? Or specifically for the nursing program? Again, yeah. uh, anything that's important? Why is academic integrity? Why do we take it so seriously? Why do you take it seriously in the nursing program? We're very curious mm -hmm. about that as well. Because we're here to learn about you as well. So. Yeah. I always find it so funny um, whenever we use this. People are trying to find people who are cheating. So I think that's the first word that comes up on a very rudimentary level is 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 how to avoid um, uh, cheating or being per perceived as cheating and not um, you know kind of the honesty and the morality and the respect comes from that. But um, it, it's funny how that just jumps into my head right away where I'm, I know it doesn't really mean all of that. No, but that's an interesting point. And again, when we work with students, often they're thinking about, and I don't want to frame it yeah. as the negative side of academic mm -hmm. integrity, but but to really, they often think it's like, what are the don'ts? 
And we really want to shift that to what are the do's? What are the benefits of academic integrity? When we talk and promote it to in students, it's, there's a lot of benefits to that side. So yeah, that's, that's an interesting point. Uh, Sandra, you have your hand up. So please. Yeah, I, I can't seem to make this work. My apologies. Oh. <laughs> um, I think we're in the business of educating people who are amongst the most trusted people. Um, in the general public. Uh, so nurses, you know, they work in that space between the, the, the stretcher and the curtain. And we need to foster a culture of trust and, in, and professional integrity. And I think that starts with education. So I think it is that unique position within nursing of supporting a learners who are going to be put, immediately be put in positions of trust uh, the minute they graduate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much for that. And and in prepping for this, we actually were reading about the nursing programs and we noticed, uh, we suspected this was true, but the nursing profession has its code of ethics, right? That every nurse is, is expected to live to and, and hold themselves to. So, sorry, Naz, you have uh, your hand up as well, please. Go yes, ahead. thank you. I'm sorry I can't turn my camera on. For me, it's, it's a lot about um, teaching students to give acknowledgement to you know, being able to essentially differentiate between what is my idea versus what is someone else's idea, right? So um, just, just being able to sort of acknowledge and validate um, that and also being able to um, cite, if, if they're using a reference or a resource, being able to sort of transparently and honestly um, acknowledge that. that, that to me is very important. Um, yeah, yeah, thanks. No, thank you. That's great. And and when we go into classrooms, because we've started, Ainsley mentioned this a little bit, and we'll mention it more later, uh, when we go into classrooms to promote it for classrooms, we often will simplify it in a very similar manner. It's like, you know, do your own work and acknowledge the work of others. We we will try and reinforce these simpler ideas for them for that reason, for exactly what you said. Just going to the screen, we have lots of great ideas here, not just the don'ts, but also the do's, accountability, yes. Educating the most, uh, sorry, my Screen is up here. That's why I'm looking up, just so you know. Educating the most trusted people uh, in the general public foster a cu culture of trust and professional integrity, honesty, integrity, originality, how to avoid cheating, perceived cheating, transparency and acknowledgement, supporting learners who, oh, here, supporting learners who will be in the position of trust. So there's a lot of great ideas, and Ainsley's going to jump in and add something here as well. So. Oh, okay. Oh, was that, Naz, were you, okay, Naz was before no, I was just going to say, I was really, I tried typing these in as we go. So all the typos are mine. I apologize as I try to type this on the screen. Um, but I like that idea. And I think that really resonates and makes this context quite specific of learners who are immediately put in that position um, and that sort of public trusted position, which might make these students in a slightly different position than other students where Academic integrity is important across the institution, but one of the things that we try to promote in this educative approach is that disciplinary specificity, disciplinary in terms of academic discipline, um, also exists. And it's important that students understand what academic integrity means, but what it means to their discipline, to their profession. And so I think that's a really interesting concept as well. So thank you for all those great Great feedback, the great ideas, and actually I was about to just pass it back to Ainsley for the next one. So thank you for that. We're going to come back and get you talking a bit more again. So I'm going to pass it back to Ainsley sure. uh, for the uh, the next one. Yeah, so thanks, Jared. You know, our, our exercise was not without uh, our next step in mind um, because we really wanted to show that academic integrity can mean different things to different people. And, and that's okay. There is, there are some sort of, there is some universality to it. There are some uni universal truths around it, but it can mean different things on the ground. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing is that we, we want to kind of convey this idea that as instructors, we not necessarily assume that students are already going to know everything they need to know about academic integrity. And this is important when they're in their first year of their undergraduate, but also important if they're returning for graduate programs, in the sense that perhaps they have stepped outside of the academic sort of context for, for a while and are coming back. So those expectations and what we promote is checking in early and often, um, you know, maybe spending five minutes at the beginning of every class, not every session, but every class, like five minutes on the first day, 10 minutes on the first day. It's not something that will be sort of one and done, learned in the first year, and then never have to speak about it again. So one of the things that we wanted to do in the context of our project was 
to put together an academic integrity statement. So the language that is up on the screen is UBC's academic integrity statement. This can be found on the academic integrity webpage. This was a statement that was developed in consultation with both campuses. So there was input from uh, UBC Vancouver and UBC Okanagan. And really what it is, is just to get everyone on the same page. This is how UBC thinks about academic integrity. And to go back to something that Fairless said earlier, the policing approach, the sort of um, detection and monitoring approach is really not where the general consensus or sort of popular approach is now. What is generally embraced is called an educative approach to academic integrity, which means that we want to support instructors and learners um, to teach and learn about academic integrity. We want to create transparency. We want to make resources available, easy to understand. We want someone to be there to answer questions, but part of that is reporting academic misconduct. So don't get me wrong, that doesn't sort of disappear from this equation. Part of an educative approach to academic integrity is also fair and transparent reporting processes and, and reporting misconduct when it occurs to keep things fair for everyone. So this language you can find on the website, it's not really intended for anything specific. I mean, it's intended to get everyone on the same page. Potentially it could be the start of a syllabus statement. And I think Jared's gonna talk about that a little bit later on where you could use like a general preamble and then um, go on to add some more specific language about why does integrity matter in this course, in this profession. And we do have guidelines on our website around how to build an academic integrity syllabus statement. But one of the core concepts of this is that academic integrity is both a set of skills and values. So th there are values that students need to understand, but there are also skills that are associated with it. Time management, citation. Um, and so that kind of dual perspective is also quite important in our work. So Jared, on to you. I think the next slide I've probably gone over enough, but just to say educative approach to academic integrity recognizes that it's a set of values and a set of skills that must be learned and refined over time. So this goes back to what we were mentioning earlier about checking in frequently, checking in often about academic integrity. And also now UBC does have this central unit that uh, instructors can refer their students to. Instructors can themselves reach out if they have questions or if they want to find resources. There are a lot of things that are accessible through that website. So, and again, a lot of this is based on our experience interacting with students when we talk to them about this, we really try and promote the idea that integrity is a central value here at UBC. And in fact, it is one of the five central values, right? As you can see here on the screen, just list them excellence, integrity, respect, accountability, and academic freedom. These are the five uh, main values that are, that are promoted and ensconced here at UBC. And integrity is one of those. And when it, UBC defines it, it's defined this way, a moral value, the quality of being honest, ethical, and truthful, which some of you said in, in the earlier comments. And when we, we talk with students, we're really trying to get them this idea that, you know, the reason, one of the reasons we take it so seriously, and we're going to talk about that in a bit, is it's this ethical standard that everybody is held accountable to, and not just students, everybody in the UBC community. It's faculty, it's staff, it's students, it's everyone. We really want to promote that. And of course, this goes beyond UBC, which again, we'll come back and talk about is that it goes beyond UBC that here, what we call academic integrity really becomes integrity in the real world out in the, in so for nursing, some of you already mentioned it, right? Out there in the real world, the nurses, there is professional standards of integrity and ethics that they are, they are um, required to live up to and to aspire to. And so, Yes, this is really what we want to get students started when we're talking to them is this idea that it's one of the central values and for good reason. There's reasons we take it so seriously. Now, speaking of the seriously or why maybe is that makes it sound a little bit extreme, but why do we take it or why is it so important? Why do we take it seriously? Why do we actually promote it so rigorously here at UBC? So a lot of this won't be a surprise to anybody, but we want to, to, to throw this out. And here we're going to try uh, a bit of a group discussion. We're actually going to try some breakout rooms. Hopefully you don't mind. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to throw this to you just to discuss for a few minutes, what are the benefits? And again, we said this earlier, right? Uh, often we think of integ academic integrity in the don'ts, the sort of the negative side, but we really want to promote the positive. What are the benefits of academic integrity? So we're going to throw that to you. 
just discuss what are the benefits if you're explaining this to students what are the benefits of academic integrity what are the risks of academic misconduct there still is consequences for the misconduct and when it's academic misconduct happens what what is the impact and who does it impacting so we just like to throw that to you so we're going to try this try the breakout rooms just for let's say five minutes i'm going to see we'll just uh let's say four rooms and you can just discuss this and we'll come back as a group and discuss it as well so let me just set that up let's say four rooms that seems about right uh let's say three rooms and we will create those and i think i hope if this goes this will work so bear with me let's try this Welcome back, everyone. Now I'm curious, when you come back, apologies for not being sure, does everybody still see my screen here when they come back? <laughs> yes. Oh, good. Okay, I wasn't sure if I send my screen to the breakouts that it loses it here, so that's excellent. So I think we're all back. Is everyone, it looks like we are. So, so let's throw it out uh, to the groups, what you discussed. So I guess the benefits we've sort of touched on that, but any particular benefits that anybody wants to share from the groups, what they talked about. And again, with the idea of being able to promote this with students, especially, like what are the benefits we want to tell them? When we're trying to promote the positive side of academic care. Anybody, I'll throw it to the group or if they want to put it in chat, any any ideas from anyone? I can go. So um, sure. one of the things that we, we talked about was um, the fact that some students, especially, you know, early on in their academic career, they may not really see the big deal of this, you know, they want to just kind of get their degree and practice and think that, you know, I'm not going to be an academic. It doesn't really apply to me. So we thought that if we somehow made it more applicable to them um, by saying, you know, if you worked um, clinically and you were developing a poster presentation or some sort of workshop that you would want to be acknowledged for the work that you did. Um, so just e even that small piece of, of um, just being recognized and respected is, is how we thought we'd mm -hmm. kind of tie it in um, to be to be relevant to our students. No, oh, great. Thank you, Marlene. Anybody else? Uh, any thoughts? Could I I have a thought just to follow up to what Marlene just shared, um, just making a few notes. So about saying some just want to get their degree and just go out and practice and not sort of going into the academic side of things. So what impacts does academic misconduct have on a nursing student's ability to practice? Are there are there issues that would come up if a student was facing an allegation of misconduct in terms of their access to the profession? Is that a dimension as well? Or Fairless, you want to answer that one? Uh, um, especially as graduate students, our students are RNs, so they are professionals, they are licensed prof practicing professionals prior to coming into the program. So um, it does have an influence on their ability to be to gain licensure with um, the professional uh, organization. So it has big impacts that I think some students um, don't take that seriously because they're just practice people. They're not academics, which is it's funny how the two divide. Uh, they separate. They don't realize that it carries academic integrity um, affects all aspects of your life. Mm -hmm. One of the things we had actually said in our, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh no, I, I just said no, thank you. No, please, please. No, it's great. Oh, I was just um, like a lot of uh, using other people's words. Um, you you are like Jill was saying, um, you're building your, your um, career on the shoulders of giants. And so, um, like having a developing your own voice um, based on the literature from the giants or the other practice partners, you develop your own voice, and it's and we thought that's that's a benefit of academic integrity because you're not going to say it the same way they do, but you have a voice too. 
And I think um, that makes you a, that makes you a better writer. It makes you a better speaker. Um, you can articulate issues based on other people's, but you have your own voice as well. So I think that's a benefit of academic integrity mm -hmm. that we were talking about in our group. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No. Thank you for that. And uh, oh, sorry. Let's let Maura and Sue talk first, then I'll comment. Uh, Maura, please. Yeah, I think one of the things that um, I talk to students about, because there is sometimes that silo between professional integrity and academic integrity, is to say that that whole process of applying, of you know, uh, getting accepted into a competitive program, that it's uh, we're looking for individuals who can. I, who who uh, value and will uphold those academic standards as well as professional ones. And then we talk about those differences and where the values are the same, how they complement each other, and that by upholding academic standards and learning how to do that well, it not only contributes to what's important about the status, the reputation of the institution, but also our profession. Great, thank you, Maura. And uh, Sue, please. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, just a quick comment. I, you know, you asked the question, "What's the impact on students if they're breaching academic integrity?" But if they, if they're, if they're brought forward, they end up with a letter on their file, and that will go forward with them if they want to go into. If they're an undergrad and they want to go into the master's program, that letter of academic integrity breach goes with them. So, on a larger scale, <laughs> future life decisions may be highly affected by that. Whether they recognize that or not, whether that's overtly expressed to them, may be a gap, an inconsistent gap that we are not addressing, um, which is probably something worth discussing, I think. Mm -hmm. No, great. That's, yeah, thank you for the comment. That's uh, very insightful. And just to go back a little bit to, to the benefits that we're saying, because um, mm -hmm. we know this, right? I mean, I come from a... Uh, teaching and learning side uh, originally. And and we know that really, even though the students aren't thinking about it, we know that really teaching and learning, or let's say the learning and the integrity go hand in hand. Because of course, if you have academic integrity, that means you're doing your own work. You're putting the effort in. You're not relying on unfair advantages or unauthorized resources. You're doing the experience that everybody wants. And that goes hand in hand with being able to learn it and practice it, which is really what we want, right? As someone mentioned, if you want them to be able to express themselves, though they need to practice writing and expressing themselves and skipping over that step isn't going to help them in the long run. Sorry, Naz, you have your, your hand up, please go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna add in line what, with what you were saying that I think it also creates a culture of, I mean, there are a variety of resources out there. So I would say all of this um, like attention to, integrity would create a culture for students to actually go back and make sure that the reference that they're using is actually the most credible one. Because as you said, I mean, there are legitimate, not legitimate resources out there. And just, you know, you could, the, the conclusions that you reach um, could, could vary very well based on the resource that you use. So to ensure that you make a robust and rigorous conclusion, I think it's very important that students pay attention to the reference and, and the, re the, the source that they're using. So, um, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. And just to, to sum up, um, I mean, I teach undergrads and I teach biology on um, first year biology students, which means 99.9993 of them want to go to med school. And in many cases, we want to change in this case, not quite the same context, but what we're after is the ability to change. We don't want somebody mentioned being competitive. We don't want them to think of academic integrity as a barrier to be the, them being competitive, but actually an advantage to be them being competitive. Because again, they're doing the effort, they're learning the skills, they're practicing all of these things, including integrity, which as you've already pointed out in nursing is incredibly important for the professional side of their career. So anyway, thank you for all that. Uh, just to move this along, that was an amazing discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, just to go to that last point, and we sort of moved into it a little bit, the impacts of academic misconduct on the student and others. And just to kind of go on to that a little bit. And again, we talk a lot about this with the students who come to, to see us because they're not thinking about these things. We've, know, we've noticed this, that the students, when academic misconduct happens, 
they're not thinking about this side, but the reality is a lot of people are impacted by that. And a lot of that's logistic for us to deal with, but also the impacts on them. So again, going back to why do we take it seriously? We've already said this, it's an ethical standard. We do take it seriously, not only because we want to have integrity, but there is a lot of impacts. And when we think about it, at least here at UBC, when we're dealing with it, yes, the instructor themselves are going to be impacted. They're putting a lot of time and effort they're investing it into the students, right? To create that rich learning experience, to give them the practice, to give them the skills, to let them work on it. That basically, somebody said earlier, gets disrespected, right? That's disrespected. It damages that relationship between the instructor and the student. And of course, the instructor has to deal with it, which creates time. Faculty, the programs, a lot of time is spent dealing with it. Not that that's the only reason we take it seriously, but we acknowledge that it does take time dealing with academic misconduct. And actually, I'll skip to the other one, other students themselves, even if they don't know about it, other students besides the student or the students that committed the academic misconduct, they are affected because essentially they've been put at a disadvantage when a group of students gives themselves an unfair advantage when they're using unauthorized resources as an example. But the one we're really worried about, again, we're worried about all of them, is the student themselves for all the reasons we've talked about, right? They have basically... Um, well, as you can see here, they've hindered their own learning, their own practice of the skills, and they've damaged the relationship with their instructor and within the UBC community. And we really want them to understand that because of course, outside, which we'll talk about later, outside of UBC, these kind of things have much more serious consequences than they do here. So there's a lot of people impacted by academic misconduct. We really want them to understand that. And many, when they come to see us, actually haven't thought about they don't understand that. So just to put that out there. Now, just to talk a little bit about students and academic misconduct, because again, we really want to promote the positive sides, and here we are talking about the negative sides a little bit, but we know that academic misconduct happens. As you can see here, students are giving themselves an unauthorized and unfair advantage. Now, the reasons that students commit academic misconduct, I mean, that could be an entire two, three, probably longer session on its own, but we generally represent it like this, this um, what's called the academic misconduct, which comes from the basically based on what's called the fraud triangle. And we know it's some combination of pressure, opportunity, and rationalization for every student. And the combination of those is of course going to be different in every case. And there's so really, there's many reasons that academic misconduct might happen. It, we could throw that out to the group. I mean, we could, if you wanna just, as I'm talking to, to throw some ideas in the chat or put up your hand, but why does this happen? Um, there are lots of things. It's, it, Often when we think about students cheating or committing academic misconduct, we're thinking about, ah, oh, these people that are just, you know, they're, they're dishonest and they're just trying to get a better grade and away they go. But it's actually far more complicated than that. Not that that's excusing any of it, but there's a far more, many, many other factors. And we know that uh, uh, we looked it up earlier from the Omsbuds, um, one of the annual reports. And it says when they analyze all their cases, only a small fraction is actually because students were just being dishonest. It actually is a lot more complicated than that. And many times we see that students are, in fact, you can see it on the fraud triangle, there's a lot of pressures on them. Sometimes they're just, there's life things happening. They, I mean, there is the competitive nature. They want a good grade. They want to be competitive. There's a lot of um, pressures from outside of UBC, family pressures and whatnot. They're just lead them. They're just feeling overwhelmed. They're falling behind. There's lots of things. Again, not excusing the academic misconduct, but it's really we. And that's one of the things we do. We're trying to when here at UBC, just trying to dig in and understand why does it happen? Because it might be just more than they wanted a better grade. And if it isn't truly more than that, if there's those those aggravating circumstances, we want to get to those roots because it might be that students have to deal with that. Right? So they don't put themselves at risk for other academic misconduct. And again, this is a much bigger topic, but just to put that out there. All right. Um, and yes, as somebody put, thank you, Naz. Uh, one contributing factor is a lack of awareness. And that's really why we want to actually promote that. Right? They may, and they may all come from different places. I, my experience is mostly with undergrads, where of course they come from high school. They may have made, may or may not have been told about these different aspects. Of course, the graduate context is a little bit different. We do expect more from them, but again we don't know what exactly they, they have brought into this. And so we just need to be able to, again, awareness is fantastic. So thank you for that. Um, and we've sort of talked about this already, but just again, bring it back. We really wanna promote this idea of academic integrity here at UBC and beyond and out in the real world, of course, we don't call it academic integrity more, it's just integrity. 
And we know that these, everything that they're building here, or sorry, everything that we're promoting here, academic integrity is a key part of that, right? As I said, we want to build the trust and relationship between students, between instructors, the entire university or UBC community. And those principles that we really are promote, we want them to practice, will translate out into the real world. And I said this earlier, a lot of the, I mean, here, if when academic misconduct happens, yes, it stings for the students, but the consequences here are much less severe than they would be in the real world. Because out there, of course, we know students can lose, if when there's breaches of academic, or sorry, academic integrity and ethics, it can be serious consequences. They could, you know, doctor or nurse could lose their license to practice, they, you know, disbarment for lawyers. There could be lawsuits. There could be criminal charges in some cases. So there's a lot of very serious consequences. We want to understand that, but we want them to also understand what we said earlier. There's benefits to it. it. Makes them more competitive. Makes their learning better. We want them to take that and also understand to avoid the consequences. And just to point that out, yes, a lot of the, we, we tell this to the students, a lot of these values and these skills that are wrapped up in academic integrity are some of those things that employers down the road really, really are looking for. Responsibility, accountability, trust, honesty. Those are things that are very valuable to future employers. So how to promote academic integrity? Really, that's what we want to talk about. How do we promote this with our students in our classes? So let's throw it to the group again as a quick discussion and do we want to do this in a group i we, we we hadn't decided anybody should we do breakout rooms again we hadn't really thought about it we, we thought does anybody have a particular <laughs> preference maybe stay in the we kind of wanted to see the size sure. of the group. Maybe stay okay. in the full group for this one so let's throw okay thank you so let's throw this to the group and we can have a quick discussion um what can we expect our students to know already know about academic integrity when they come in. And again, my context mostly is undergrads, but for you, for graduate students, what can we expect that they're bringing in with them? How can we promote academic integrity in your courses? And what resources might help with this? You know, if you had a perfect world, what would you like to see? So let's throw that out. Anybody have any ideas? You throw it in chat, you turn on your microphone. Jared, I what might just we... add something. Oh, sure, um, please go ahead, Ainsley. Yeah, just to kind of speak to the, the question to launch this part. You know, I want to loop back. If we think back to the academic integrity statement that we introduced earlier on and all the ideas within that around skills and concept and everyone plays a part. Um, when we were thinking about this, this section, we were really thinking about that concept of, well, what part can we play as instructors? And what might be our responsibilities that word is used informally. What might be our, our opportunity that we have to teach students about academic integrity? So just wanted to kind of frame this question within that idea of everyone plays a part. The students have a part, instructors have a part, UBC has a part as well. Sorry, turn off my mic. So I'll put up the whiteboard if we just want to throw some ideas up, but I'd like to throw it out to the group because especially in the nursing, and nursing graduate context what do you expect your students are already bringing in with them like what are your expectations we're curious so Zachary please this is coming more from a student side of things but someone who's also I've also worked as a sessional lecturer in another faculty and I think my opinion I'm curious what other faculty or faculty would say is that while in theory we might like to think that there are that students should know all this I don't think that we should. I think just assuming that students know all of this is probably pretty risky and is not setting them up for success, particularly when we think that so much of the aspect of uh, academic integrity isn't just the values, but those skills and that those skills may, maybe they should have been taught in prior degrees, but to assume that they have, I don't think is fair to the students, as well as to recognize that I think you know, we're living within this academic world and how academic integrity and integrity relate to each other, but there are certain aspects of academic integrity that are like ideas that I don't think are obvious on the face of them. So the one I always come to is like self-plagiarism, I think is not an idea that is automatically obvious if someone who's not been part of academia for a long time. That is an important idea within academia, but so just assuming that students understand all of these nuances and skills I don't think it serves them well. And so the expectation should be actually, in my opinion, on the faculty to set clear expectations and provide the resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great thought. Yes, self plagiarism we know can really catch them out. It's one we get a lot where it's like, wow, I didn't know that that was a thing. So, so thank you, Zachary. That was a, it was a 
Excellent. Um, Francis, you, you have your hand up as well. Yeah, um, yeah to, to sort of rebuttal um, Zach's comment, I think what I was thinking was um, that I don't expect them to know anything about academic integrity, but what I do expect is that they'll have a sense of um, an ethical sense, an inherent honesty. You know, they come with all these pos the positive things you'd hope for, you know, they're honest, they're ethical. Um, so that um, that integrity piece is there. The academic piece needs to be spoken to more specifically. And so in thinking about the next piece was, is what do you do to promote it? Well, it's very nice to have a statement in the syllabus. I'm sure there'll be a committee created for that, but the, the students don't read it. Don't read the syllabus. Um, so I think we all need to make a point and to speak to Sue's point earlier, there needs to be some consistency in how we're messaging. Um, so we, we, you know, short of a cue card we all carry around, we, we, we have these debates within our, our um, schools. And then we, I was thinking that in the fall, I teach a theory course and um, I will just talk about academic integrity, perhaps use some of the slides you've just provided, but also um, discuss in a way my expectations and the value that is inherent in some of the opportunities they have. So I have to speak, the, the big part of the course is working with senior mentors, older adults, and being respectful. And actually, I actually have a paper about the senior mentor's perspective, and they talk about some some instances of lack of respect for their time and and what they wanted to do and that's going to be part of the introduction to the course um so sorry i'm rambling but those are the things that came to my mind no it's 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 great actually i'm going to come back to some of this in a, in a few slides so thank you for for introducing some of those uh or having some or sharing some of those thoughts excuse me uh Fairless, can I throw it to you quickly? Yeah, I was just, what I, um, I, I've changed over the past year. I always thought that all of the students, because they were graduate students and it, being in the NP program, really high GPAs. We only took 15 students into the program every, every year. It's very highly academically competitive. Many of them come with lots of different degrees and masters and PhDs. So I always just made the, the assumption that they knew it all by the time they came to us, which was a mistake on my part. Um, because, you know, they're even getting into a different field as well. So a lot in their practicum placements, um, there's lots of ethical issues that occur in clinical practice sites that they haven't been in before. Uh, the pharmaceutical companies chase our students like crazy and always want to offer free lunches. But, um, you know, uh, as healthcare professionals, we should never accept those. And um, there's lots of things to talk about to our students. So I've mm -hmm. changed. <laughs> I just wanted to put that in there. No, thank you. Appreciate the, the thoughts. Uh, Sandra, please. You know, I think when we ask what, what do students know, you know, I, I just put it back on me as faculty who teaches only one graduate course. And I, I find that I'm probably not that great at identifying it uh, when there is a lack of integrity. We've talked a lot about the word trust here, and I think I certainly rely a lot on trust and kind of like the fact that people are at school to to learn how to do, you know, good academic things. But um, and I know this might not be the topic for today, but the how can pro instructors promote academic integrity in their courses a part of me is on a, as a learner is trying to figure out how to identify it. We've had some internal discussions about, you know, everything ranging from, you know, just basic plagiarism to chat GPT, et cetera. Um, but I, I, I just want to say that I don't feel fully equipped to manage the identification, let alone the management of the student uh, to get to where we're going. So that's the only point I wanted to make. Well, thank you. And uh, quickly, um, just to uh, Manon, hopefully I said your name correctly. Yes, perfect. No worries. Um, I wanted to say that I fully agree with what has been said and feel the same way. And I did the, um, the integrity module, uh, academic integrity for uh, plagiarism, 
just uh, this weekend because I had been told that it was good. And I learned. And so I imagine that students, because this is something that we will put forth, I think, um, maybe it's new for some, some people, but this is something that we will put forth um, for all students that are entering the graduate program to do. So, and I think it's going to be great so that they start at the same level at least, because I too was under the impression that they should know this, but I've been made aware that they don't. And the thing is that, especially in some programs where it's very hard to get in, we, that's it. They are super competitive. They really are, uh, you know, type A, they want to do well. They want to do well so much that they, they they want to cite so well the work of others that they and not make mistakes well they don't really cite it they just copy and paste so that it's so accurate that they they're really replicating what the others have have said they provide the the reference but they don't you know put put it in their own words they don't um, so um so that's something that i've i've uh, experienced and the students they feel awful because the thing is that they don't um, they didn't know that they were doing this and so that's the thing is that how can you if they didn't know then then it's hard to say well you know you should have known better um so that's why we want to i think establish the fact that at the beginning they will all have the same baseline knowledge so that at least then they start on the same page. Yes, and thank you. And all of this segues very nicely into the next set of slides. It's almost like we did this on purpose, um, just to kind of follow up. So promoting it, how do we promote it? Because yes, sort of, a, and this is, I, I do it too, as an instructor, we assume they come into our classes knowing this stuff, like they were just born with it, but actually it's not always true. And so just to kind of go through some general things that we recommend and just to, over the next few slides, first of all, just this list here, yes. First one is don't make assumptions about what students know. And we, again, I make this mistake too as an instructor. I totally understand it, but we have to get past that and realize, yeah, maybe they're not all on the same page in how they see it. And so with that in mind, we want to say, talk to them early, talk to them often about academic integrity. Uh, we don't do this, again, I'm guilty. We don't do this nearly enough in our classes to talk about it early, talk about it often. We want to be very clear with expectations and guidelines when it comes to academic integrity for assignments, for exams, for all of those. We, we understand this as instructors, but again, just to point out, we really want to be crystal clear with simple language about what is it we expect for them so they, they understand. We want to model good behavior. Again, I'm going to put up my hand and say I'm a little guilty of this. I'm really trying in my slides, for example, to always reference all of the nice, pretty pictures that I've, I've, I've cribbed for, from the textbook to remember to do things like that. Model it for them. Show them that this is what I do. This is what I expect so they can see it. Build assessments with academic integrity in mind. It's amazing how many in our classes, we see this all the time, even in classes I've worked with, where we do these, these assessments that are clearly, clearly not really thinking about, oh, okay, what are maybe the problems with academic integrity in this kind of thing? And we saw this a lot in COVID and we didn't have a choice, but as soon as we moved to online exams, we saw this very quickly about, you know, that context isn't really necessarily the best for academic integrity with that or, or with the academic integrity in mind. Emphasize why it's beneficial. We've talked about that. It's good to tell students, why is it beneficial? Why does it make you, you know, give you the skills? Why does it make you more competitive down the road for employers? And this last one is one we're really trying to get everybody just to, to remind everybody about. Encourage them to ask when they're in doubt. It's amazing how many students make mistakes because they are just feel intimidated about asking or they feel silly. No, we don't want you to feel silly, please. If you're in doubt, ask me, the instructor, ask the TAs, ask someone. It's better to ask, even if it was something you should have known, than to make the mistake and get dinged for it afterwards. We really want to encourage everybody, encourage students, ask if in doubt. So some general tools that we have, we have a toolkit that we've assembled here at UBC, and we're going to add to this in all, all the time, just some general tools that you can use. So the first one is, of course, somebody mentioned this, the syllabus, that's your first line of defense, so to speak, setting out exactly what you 
why academic integrity is important in this class, what your expectations and guidelines are, right? Use the positive language. Why is it a benefit to you as a student to follow academic integrity? Why does it matter? Um, to promote it in your class, we have what's called, as I mentioned this, the Take Five for Academic Integrity slides that we, and we're happy to come and do it for you. It's, it's, it's we have available on our website. Uh, do you, Ainsley was already ahead of me. So there's the link to it. You can present this on your own. There's notes there of how to do it, but we're happy to come into your classes. We can, you can request us to come in and talk to your students about this, just to help promote academic integrity and talk about all the stuff we've mentioned here today in a much more succinct format, I might add. Academic well-being services, there's lots of services and programs on campus that are available to students that help them both in terms of their academic well-being and their emotional, mental well-being as well. And that's an important part of it. The well-being of students is an important side of academic integrity because we know a lot of pressures when well-being has been neglected on their side, a lot of pressure. They can feel overwhelmed, pressures build up, they can put themselves at risk for these. So things like the Chapman Learning Commons Center for Writing and Scholarly Communication, which is excellent for learning about how to write effectively, and the Wellness Center, things like that. Oh, Ainsley wants to add, so please, Ainsley. I'll add when you're finished. Don't stop, it's okay. Oh, sorry, okay, well, I'll keep with my flow. And the last one is, and um, sorry, Mano, was it you that said that you tried the, and thank you for that, the one of our academic integrity modules. We have a number of modules, built on Canvas, available for anybody to deploy in their classes. Some of these we actually use when students come to see us for cases of academic misconduct, but these are available to be used for promotional, for uh, promotional, I made it sound right, but for promoting academic integrity, for being preventative, right? They don't have to just be reactive. So we have four of those available. We have intro academic integrity. We have our, what's called the academic integrity matter modules, which is um, the plagiarism one, one that Menon mentioned. There's writing and plagiarism, there's collaboration and cheating. And we have a brand new one listed here on the top right, the Academic Integrity Foundations, which we just launched. It's brand new. We are just in the process of adding it to our website. So it's ready to go during the summer and in particular, ready to go for the September semester. So that's the brand new one that we have. Uh, so all of these are available to deploy in your classes. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a second, a bit more, but uh, Ainsley, please. Yeah, thanks, Jared. Um, I think just to kind of sum up from what we're presenting, really, which is kind of an overflow of information here, but I, I like that there's been a couple of really distilled ideas. Don't make assumptions and make a plan. I think that could be something that we use to sort of structure what we're talking about. If we don't assume that everybody already knows about academic integrity, and then we make a plan for how to deal with it in the course, you will have an abundance of resources to use. So I think that the availability of resources will not be um, an issue at all. And like Jared said, I'll just spend another moment on the Take Five for Academic Integrity, which I put in, in the chat. That's a new program that we developed this past year through the Academic Integrity Hub. And it gives instructors two options. Either they use the slide deck that is there, along with the speaking notes that are there to take five or 10 minutes. Jared says it actually takes 10 or 15, but the name sounds better, take five. Um, and then the other option is to request that one of the Academic Integrity Hub staff, that would be Jared, um, as his role is sort of the, the education part of our, of our office, um, come into your classroom and spend 15 minutes with your students. So if you prefer to do that, there are lots of different ways that that, that could occur. So I just wanted to kind of shed, like go return to that because it's a, it's a really great opportunity. Um, and, you know, there would be the chance to kind of work specifically as well with the disciplines if there were a couple specific things that you know a certain program or department wanted to be mentioned we could certainly work with that as well great thank you Ainsley. uh we're actually after the hour and we'd like to leave some to oh maura please yeah uh thanks for that offer Ainsley and jared and one of the things i was thinking about is maybe when we do orientation so when we do fall orientation, we have all the students there. Um, that might be a really good time if we could, you know, like fairly even if we could put the MSN and the NP students together on orientation day. I'm not sure about that, but um, you know how we do that. And maybe Zach has some ideas about that too. But um, that's a time where you can catch all the students yeah. and and uh, and and really help them start to have that conversation and to think about it because we're going to put stuff in the syllabi, 
you know, we're going to ask students to do the AI modules. They'll have a certificate they'll get. Um, but I think it's those conversations that faculty have with them. And even the way that you've been doing it through this session of whiteboarding or breakout rooms is to really give people a chance to think about it and talk about it together. I, I think that that's a very powerful way for people to understand why it's important rather than just reading about it or doing a self-study. So we, we, could, we could hopefully plan that for orientation. Absolutely, and, and let us know. We're, we're, we're very flexible to work. We're working with different orientations as well. We've adapted some of our material for Jumpstart, and last year I did a session for GNPS. So we, we, we are open to that type of opportunity, and that's really the flexibility that we want to be able to provide with the hub. The hub has universal truths around academic integrity, but at the level of faculties and schools, sometimes things need to be conveyed differently. There are different things to accent. There are different times when it will resonate more. There are different skills that maybe need to be focused on. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Yeah, we're, we're super happy to help out in any way we can. So, and uh, Sue, please. Yeah, just a quick question, uh, Jared. I think you referenced this, the Academic Integrity Foundation. So for two courses, theory courses that I teach, I have the students do the module cheating one that, and the module plagiarism, and then they submit them and we add, we add like nominal marking, like a couple of marks and stuff. But what is the foundations one? And then maybe this is a, after the, the session, but I'm sure others might want to know how that does that interface with this? Is that part yeah, of it? Jared, maybe I'll speak to that if you don't mind. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Thanks. I was I was going to say earlier when we were sort of reviewing what was on this slide. Quite honestly, there are almost too many modules at this point um, because it becomes confusing of which one is which. So let me just give you a little bit of a, of a of an explanation of where these come from. Introduction to academic integrity was one that was developed by a faculty member in the English department, Laurie McNeil. Um, the two ones that start with the letters AIM, AIM. Those are the two that have been sort of in circulation the most over the past year. They were adapted from modules that were in use on the Okanagan campus who had themselves adapted them from other institutions that was Creative Commons and, and adapted them to UBC. Academic Integrity Foundations is our module that Jared and I made that is entirely under our control, as it were, in the sense that we've adapted it really to include a lot more of the language around UBC's educative approach. We've adapted it to reflect uh, more accurately where we are in terms of central support for academic integrity, the resources we have available. So I would say it's more reflective of UBC Vancouver's approach, and it's really up to date. But have a look, and we're welcome to feedback, because like Jared said, it's not even on the website yet. It's so new. Our idea and our thought um, is that it might become part of a program that we're tentatively thinking of calling Academic Integrity 101, which would be a program where if an instructor noticed that a student was struggling, they could refer that student to our office and we would have sort of a consultation with them that would consist in watching that module and then spending half an hour or an hour speaking with one of us about sort of the academic skill side and the understanding of concepts. So that's just a little bit more of the lay of the land around that module. Okay, so so you're saying it's not because I can't see it here when I'm on the on your site on the it's not even there yet. <laughs> okay, and so how do we view it when you said view it and give you like we can put we can put the link oh, in the chat. That'd be awesome. Yeah, yeah so yeah, great. We'll put yeah, the canvas yeah. link in the chat. That's great, and I just want to say the other two modules are fantastic. Like I've done them, and and I haven't run it in both my theory courses, and I, it just gives me knowing of that there's a foundation there. So that I can speak back to the students afterwards if there's ever an issue. Like you've done these, you've sent in your certificates. You should, you know, and then we refer them off to the the Chapman Commons kind of writing and stuff like that if they need it. So thank you. That's great. And and you know, you might find you still want to use those ones. Like it, there's no like we won't take it personally. These are just sort of more adapted to the Vancouver context. But we really like the other ones too, uh, Sue, that you were mentioning the AIM ones. Um, yeah. I see Jared has put the Canvas link in in the chat there, so you'll be able to check out the the very newest one. Great, thank you very much. So, uh, just to to move along a little bit because I know we're coming up here at the end. We guess there's questions. Uh, so, what we wanted to show is kind of just to encapsulate that into what it might look like in practice. So very quickly, just a general idea. And some of this we've already covered. So, sorry, let me 
get rid of that on my screen. So yeah, starting with the syllabus, clearly stating the expectation guidelines. And we do have, um, it sounds like you have some language you like to use. We have some guides as well. I'll just throw that in the chat. So on that page, there is some guidelines too. If you need some language for the syllabus, we have some right there. The AI presentation, again, we mentioned this, if you need us to come in and, and help with that, but our take five slides are available for anybody to use. You could do that at the beginning of your class or at the beginning of orientation, wherever you like. Assigning a module, this, again, we can use this. We, you know, a lot of classes assign this for participation grade. It's actually built into the class. Go take it, give us a certificate. You get some participation points for that. And then also when you're doing, and this is one that I've tried actually in my fourth year microbiology classes to do whenever they have relevant assignments, like writing assignments or presentations to give them AI checklists that they can actually walk through. You know, what resource did I use? Did I, have I cited them correctly? And so on and so forth. I tried this in my fourth year class, specifically around chat GPT. It was actually quite interesting. A lot of them really walked through. They really thought about, ah, do we want to use chat GPT or not? A lot of them came to the conclusion it wasn't really for them. And if you'd like to see a very very nice example of this um, from the University of Toronto, these kind of checklists, specifically, this is for writing assignments and plagiarism. I'll just throw this in. You can actually go there and scroll down. They have a very nice checklist that you can check out and eventually we'll probably have something similar for ours. But just to give you an idea of what you can do in your classes. So just to, um, you know, we were going to talk about what is academic misconduct and discuss that. I'm wondering if we, Ainsley, what do you think? Should we just move past the group discussion because we're coming yeah, up? Yeah, I was going to suggest let's just skip the discussion and sure. move directly to the slide where we outline the types of misconduct. So, yes. So that's what I thought as well. So just to give you an idea of how UBC defines the different types. Now, from what we have understood from talking with Maura uh, and just actually also here in the chat, a plagiarism is one that uh, in this nursing department, um, sorry, the nursing program, especially the graduate program that you know, you're seeing and you're worrying about. But here's the different types very quickly. Falsification, providing false information, giving a doctor's note when you're not sick, as an example, cheating. So at UBC, we, we call cheating specifically if you give yourself an unfair and unauthorized advantage during an assessment. So mostly that's exams. Cheat sheet, looking at your phone, whatever that might look like. Plagiarism, we kind of get that one, using someone else's words or ideas without attribution. Self-plagiarism, yes, somebody brought that up, and that's one that takes students by surprise, and they're just absolutely shocked when they realize they can't use the same work twice for credits in two different classes, because the first time they use it, it's novel. The second time, it's no longer novel, original work. They're supposed to actually do it again or you know add to it they can or cite themselves and add to it which is something that for most students is a little strange and then personation if you know you take the place of somebody during an exam as an exam or you have somebody take your place that would be impersonation so very quickly uh if we had more time we'd throw it out but yes we understand plagiarism is one that um, nursing programs are very worried about and uh Ainsley I'll throw this to you I don't know do you want to quickly talk somebody mentioned chat GPT earlier we know everybody is thinking about it so yeah, and I just put something in the chat, um, an upcoming event. So some of you might follow. One of the things I wanted to mention earlier in terms of resources, um, another thing that we try to do through the hub is we stay quite connected to the CTLT Institute. So the summer, the spring, and the winter institute, we really try to have something on academic integrity on the program. Um, so we've offered in the past, you know, how to teach academic integrity in your class. We've offered a session in the winter around um, an educative approach to academic integrity. At nine o'clock this morning, um, I did a session on generative AI and sort of institutional resources and guidelines that are that are available. So um, it's a good transition, actually, from where Jared was outlining the different types of misconduct, because gener generative artificial intelligence tools or chat GPT or any of the other tools that have emerged over the past six months since this became more of a of a widespread um, thing can really intersect with a number of those those categories. So generative artificial intelligence, chat GPT is not something you're going to find listed in our misconduct policy, but anything a student uses that's not authorized, that gains an unfair advantage, could be considered misconduct. So the use of generative AI tools, if it's not allowed by the instructor, um, it certainly could be considered misconduct. I might ask you, Jared, if you could pop the FAQ we're giving you a lot of resources here. I think we might need to follow up with a sheet, but um, the FAQ on ChatGPT, where you'll find some of the common sort of questions and answers that we've seen thus far from students and instructors. And one of them is specifically, is the use of generative AI considered to be academic misconduct? And we outlined three scenarios. 
Um, we outline the scenario where it is permitted, we outline the scenario where it is forbidden, and we outline the scenario where the instructor has not talked about it or discussed it, because that's going to be pretty common. We don't expect that every instructor will have already included a syllabus statement specifying what their position is on generative AI tools. Um, but I encourage you to go take a look at that FAQ because there are good resources for how to start thinking about this. The reason being is that there's no institutional policy on generative artificial intelligence. And at this time at UBC, this is an instructor and eventually potentially program level decision um, around whether to use them, why and, and how. So just wanted to mention that briefly as one of the new things that you might start seeing, you know, contract cheating was was another one and we didn't include a slide on that, but, um, you know, outsourcing work and having others complete work or having others complete degrees. These are sort of some of the ways that that cheating can be becoming increasingly technologically sophisticated and it loops back to the question that I I don't recall who posed it, but was talking about detection. How are we how are we to detect these types of academic misconduct? And it's easy to say that the policing approach is not the approach that we want to take. Um, and there are a lot of things that we hope can happen before. Um, but it's important to understand the tools as well. So just wanted to briefly allude to that. Um, UBC has some resources, especially one um, that has been released by the CTLT on assessment design in an era of generative artificial intelligence. But these tools are so new, they've only been around about six months. Conversations are still very much active and ongoing in this area. Okay, and uh, just to respect time, I think I'm going to make the audible call to to skip on just slightly here to um, just to give you and we've posted a lot of these in the chat, but just so you have it in one place, some additional resources if you'd like to check it out. We have our website, the Take Five, the Academic Integrity Digest. We have. Uh, do you want to speak about that, Ainsley? Because you know you're sure, heavily we, involved in that. Yeah. Sure, we hadn't mentioned that, but. Um, in February of this year, the provost offices on both campuses um, have been, since February of this year, have been collaborating to release what is going to be a quarterly newsletter on academic integrity. So we've had two issues come out so far. The first one was on generative AI tools and academic integrity. And the second one, which came out just last week, was on student perspectives in academic integrity. So, you know, I could see in the future that there could be an interesting opportunity here to do some kind of issue around professional ethics and how they intersect with academic integrity, there could really be the need to, to talk about that because I know it's not just in nursing that, that these questions are coming up. So all of those are archived on the website and you can find them there, but we generally feature resources and an editorial, and it just gives a good overview of a certain topic and how it intersects with academic integrity. Thank you. And then just to, to finish off, yes, uh, we have some resources both for student and faculty on our website. And finally, this last one, because I know there was some interest in Turnitin, just a link to the Turnitin uh, guide from CTLT that walks through how to use it and for use for, you know, checking for, well, uh, detecting plagiarism for students' uh, written work. So that's there if you'd like it. And with that, I think we'll just uh, throw it to back to you. And thank you for listening to us. And if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer anything any questions you might have. So thank you again. Just, it's it's more, and I do have a question. Um, we, we, we had um, a graduate program committee report um, basically uh, requiring uh, graduate the graduate level courses to include the AI modules, get the certificate, um, but also uh, use use of turn it in. And I've had quite a bit of pushback from some faculty. Unfortunately, they couldn't be on the call today um, about turn it in and ethical concerns about it. And uh, I know Zach had some concerns about it too. And I know that Turnitin is not really um, something that either of you are talking about, but um, I think the big, I, I, I'm just wondering if you do have any thoughts about other tools or resources that could be used um, to, to help us work with students around academic integrity other than turn it in. I think we just think, oh, turn it in. That's the only thing we have. So I don't know if there are other recommendations. Mm -hmm. 
Um, that's a great that's a great question. So um, with Turnitin, obviously Turnitin is a tool that's centrally supported by by UBC. So the reason why we don't go into any of that here is because that's sort of in the realm of the learning technologists who I had put the link in the chat and Jared included it as well. If there was the desire to to learn more and to understand how to use Turnitin in sort of an, an educative way, that's sort of their their sphere. So we don't want to go too far into that. Um, some of you may have heard that Turnitin also recently um, integrated an AI detection tool into their similarity report. So the similarity report is, is the report that would be generated um, when sort of comparing student writing against their database. And in early April of this year, in line with all the developments around generative artificial intelligence, they announced that they would be integrating that into four existing clients. UBC has not activated that tool. So you cannot use AI, detect. you cannot use Turnitin for AI detection. And there's a great decision, maybe Jared, <laughs> You post yet another link, please, um, for the, the from the Learning Technology Hub around why the university is not activating this artificial intelligence detection tool. Um, and I think that it's useful to read just from for sort of thinking about policing more generally. Um, I think there's ways to use Turnitin there that are not that are sort of more developmental. Uh, and again, this would be definitely more in the realm of, of the CTLT. If we're thinking beyond Turnitin. Um, I think the only thing that that could come up there would be in vigilation soft, like some of the sort of lockdown browser type things that were that were in use during the, the pandemic. But that's the only thing that comes to mind for me, Jared. I don't know if there's anything. No, we don't. Yeah, that's about the extent of it in terms of yeah. tech tools that are used for detection. I think too, you know, we've had, we've been having a lot of conversations about this because ultimately when you think about it, how do you, how do you suspect academic misconduct? You know, what's the first thing that happens? And the first thing that usually happens is that there's some kind of red flag. If, if you haven't observed something happening, say in an assessment, that there's some kind of red flag in the academic work. Um, and one of the ways that we've been thinking about it is some of this comes down to the expertise of the faculty. A lot of it comes down to the expertise of the faculty who are going to have a hunch that something is off. But the world is changing so much in terms of what is technologically possible that it's also up to the, the institution and those who specialize in this area to support faculties in having informed hunches um, that are based on actual red flags. You know, there's certain ways and very early days, but there's certain ways that people say that you can kind of sense that something is written by AI. But it also comes down to like, what's the type of work your student regularly produces and what have there been sort of other stages of this assignment that have come up? So, you know, these things are complex and often there's an interplay between what might be produced by a tech tool and a lot of other factors that are within the expertise and the relationship that the instructor has with their student. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I it's 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 a very complex issue. Very. Yeah. Were there Zach, any other did, questions or I, I just wanted to see Zach, did did you have anything in particular you wanted to add to that? Just so that Jared and Ainsley know about your concerns. I mean, I don't want to get too into it. Um, I think some of the concerns I've raised about turn it in, I think, are not novel in any part. Uh, but other things that other people have the fact that it's uh, you know stored in U.S. servers, privacy concerns, the fact that it's like not educative but punitive, as well as just some logistical things. I've had it go down right when I was about to submit an assignment, and then it's a big stress headache. And anyway, but I don't think any of that's sort of novel. I'm sure they've kind of heard all of those concerns. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Well, it's, it looks like 
lots of food for thought. My gosh, um, I, I have a lot of reading ahead of me, I think. Um, but thank you for all the great resources and for your time today, Jared and Ainsley. And uh, if, if any other questions come up, um, I'll, I'll uh, email you and maybe we can correspond a bit that way. We're having our graduate program committee meeting tomorrow where we're going to be talking more about what needs to go in our syllabus around academic integrity. And um, that's a concern for all of us, you know, is getting ready for full term and how are we going to use the time right, right, with students to, for our, our incoming students to make it a more, um, a, a more educative approach than the punitive approach. So thank you. This is, this is awesome. I'm going to stop the, um, I can figure out where to do it. Stop the recording.